Hello, everybody. My name is James Brown, and I'm the vice president of the Society for American Soccer History in the United States, and also one of the co-organizers, founders of the 1930 World Cup Conference and events that are currently being held in Montevideo, Uruguay, as well as uh, throughout the word world virtually. And today, I'm here with, with uh, Max Geringer and his son, Renato. Hello, gentlemen, how are you? We're fine, thank you. Good, good. Thank you very much for, for being with us today. Uh, today, we're gonna talk about Brazil's uh, entrance into the World Cup, how they came to be the selection of their team and the experience uh, throughout the World Cup. So um, I've had the pleasure of uh, going through uh, one of the books of Max, it's the, uh, the, the great history of, of cups, uh, the 1930, 34, and 38 World Cup. It was a pleasure to, to, to look through and I look through. I look forward to uh, to accumulating all of the other uh, versions. So, uh, gentlemen, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule today to to be with me to talk about Brazil and their uh, their special journey down to the first uh, World Cup. So, please tell me the. The moment that Brazil had decided that they wanted that they wanted to participate in the World Cup, and then the steps that the federation took to to move towards that coach selection, team selection, trials. Okay, uh, we have a very brief history matter here that we would like to comment about 1930 world cup if you allow us oh yes of course yeah. that's history that's history uh argentina and buenos aires or argentina buenos aires uruguay and montevideo were part of the spanish kingdom and when the spanish left uh uruguay was kind of loose it was called the Provincia Oriental, the Oriental Province, because it was at the uh, east of the Rio de la Plata. Uh, so Brazil decided to annex Uruguay, the, the territory of Uruguay to Brazil, and that was made in 1817. Uh, Uruguayans didn't like it because they spoke Spanish and we Brazilians spoke Portuguese and they uh, with the support of Argentina they declared war on Brazil and uh, they won the war in 19 <laughs> yeah, they won the war in 1828 they won the war we signed a treaty we uh, gave up the territory and uh, then two years after in 1830 they issued their first constitution and that's the reason why <laughs> 100 years later they promoted the world cup besides being uh, twice uh, olympic champions in football they had their centenary to celebrate that's the reason why the stadium the stadium in montevideo is called the centenario 400 years Amazingly, if Brazil had won that war, we wouldn't have a cup in 1930. So Uruguay would still be part of Brazil. So we are kind of happy as football lovers that we lost it. But of course, as a, a nation, we were not so happy. And there's a, a short note of a Brazilian newspaper here uh, from 1930, well, I'm sorry, 1830, complaining that we lost a war against a very small nation at our doors. We spent 100 million, whatever the currency was at the time. We had 8,000 citizens sacrificed 
and we got nothing out of it. We just gave the territory back. Congratulations to the Uruguayans, very, very strong, right? courageous people. And because That's of true. that, we had a cup, a World Cup in 1930, well deservedly, because of their two titles, Olympic titles, and because of this war they won. Now, uh, Brazil. <clears throat> Brazil for a long, long time uh, had only two cities competing in football. Rio de Janeiro, which was the capital city, the biggest, largest city in the country, and Sao Paulo. Sao Paulo was smaller, but it was growing very, very fast in the 20th century. I have some numbers somewhere here. We have the Sao Paulo population here. Uh, Rio was the second city in Latin America, or at least in South America, after Buenos Aires, the capital city of, the, of Argentina. And uh, Rio had Nearly in 1930, uh, almost a million people. Sao Paulo started the 20th century with 200,000 oh, people. Okay. It was 1900. And in 1930, 30 years later, the number was 890,000. So from 200, from almost 900, so they were very, very developed. The oh, football in Brazil started in the city of Sao Paulo, and uh, it was in, 19, in 1894 when a uh, Brazilian uh, of uh, English descendants, English and Scottish descendants, Charles Miller, went to England to study. They came back to Brazil. Uh, he was 19, 20 years old. He brought uh, football, a ball, uh, the shirts, the shoes, uh, but mostly he brought a book about the English championship rules. Uh, that, if I'm not wrong, it started three or four years before that. Until then, the English championship was the killing one. So like in the old days of for many horses with uh, trying to hit each other. And uh, then the, the, the English league started with rules, everybody against everybody. And it made the, the, the championship more competitive, more attractive, delighted yeah. to follow and everything. Otherwise your team would lose the first job and get out. And they have another chance six, six months later. So Mr. Miller uh, brought that book and said, okay, we want to have a championship exactly like that in Brazil. It took a while, like uh, eight, from 19, 1894 to 1902. That was the first Brazilian championship. In Rio, they practiced, practiced cricket. There was a, 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 okay. a club called Paysandu. There was the English club in the city. And uh, there was a, a newspaper in Rio. Try, try to find the Rio News. What was the story? Uh, that, that, was a, that was always a common grouping. Yeah. yeah well, so you... Rugby, football, cricket, bowling. Yes. You know, the, these clubs were always very, very close. Okay. That's where you find all the variations. There, uh, was, you know, the yeah, there was a newspaper in Rio. It was uh, called Rio News and was written in English. And uh, Sao Paulo started the championship in 19, uh, 1902, as I said. Uh, and Rio News uh, published a note in 1900 saying in English, Renato will read it for you better because it's in English here. Football matches, both rugby and association, are spoken of, but we fear our Paulista friends will have that to themselves, as the weather in Rio is too trying for football. Hmm. It was a, the, the high humidity and high temperature, and uh, 
they said we're gonna keep <laughs> playing rugby because <laughs> we can just we don't have to run too much. Uh, that's why we started in 1906 when Sao Paulo had already started, and for 20 years, 30 years, uh, the, the the football teams from Sao Paulo were stronger than the ones in Rio. Uh, the first one who, who had an international experience was a club called Paulistano in 1925. They went to Europe and beat the French selection 6-2 or 8 with the great uh, center forward Friedenreich scoring lots of goals. First great Brazilian player. That was the one. Yeah. In, in when, when we were amateurs, that was Frieder Rasch. He was uh, a Brazilian guy. His father was uh, this, a German descent. Yeah, they went in the south called South Santa Catarina, which was populated by German immigrants. Uh, his mother was Brazilian. It was called Arthur Frieden Reich. And uh, what happened is that the federations from Rio and Sao Paulo, they always got along together very well, never a problem. The problem was the Sao Paulo Federation and the Brazilian Federation, which was instituted in 1916, because we need a national federation to take part in the first South American championship. So we had to be accepted by FIFA and first to the South American Confederation. It all happened. And uh, it was a discussion where it should be in Sao Paulo because uh, of the uh, seniority of the football, football in Sao Paulo or in Rio. And of course it was in Rio. And uh, there were promises that uh, the people from Sao Paulo would take part in all decisions, so, uh, we'll do it together and uh, it didn't happen. Uh, and Sao Paulo feeling having put aside in all the decisions, they started to do in 1920 something <laughs> uh, as kind of a revenge that was not to allow the Sao Paulo players to play in the national team. Mm, okay. So what, what we read about the 1930 World Cup was that oh, the Sao Paulo uh, didn't allow his players to go to Montevideo. That was right, but uh, it was a long, long story that started in 1920. That was 10 years of fight. In 1919, we won the American, South American Championship. That was our first international title. Okay. Argentina and Uruguay were much, much better than Brazil at the time. But in 1919, it was played in Brazil. And Brazil won, beating Uruguay. Over time, 1-0, a goal by Friedenreich, our great guy. And uh, that was a big party in Brazil. Uh, Friedenreich's shoe were exposed for months in, uh, in a, a store in Rio de Janeiro. The boot with which he scored the goal. In 1920, there was another South American championship. Brazil was the champion, defending champion. It would be in Chile, in Santiago. And uh, Sao Paulo refused the players. Brazil went with a team from Rio de Janeiro and lost to Uruguay, that we were beaten, had beaten uh, a year before by 6-0. Yeah. It was the largest difference in goals of the, our national team suffered until the infamous 7-1 to Germany some years ago. We tried to forget, but <laughs> for the, throughout the, the decade, 1920s, right. the, the, often the, the Sao Paulo Federation said, oh, we will not. Well, sometimes we will, sometimes we will not. And in 1930, it happened again. There was a discussion. Uh, Sao Paulo wanted to have uh, a member in the, I would say, the technical commission of the, the, the staff of the national team. Uh, 
the Brazilian Confederation said, no, no, there will be our guys. And Sao Paulo said, okay, we will not uh, send our folks. The bad thing is that in the first list of players that were supposed to go to Uruguay, 22 players, 15 were from Sao Paulo and seven from Rio de Janeiro. Okay. When Rio de Janeiro decided, okay, if you don't want to go, you are not patriotic enough to go, we despise you, we will go by ourselves. And then they made, put together a team that was weak. Another bad thing is that the, the press in Rio and the press in Sao Paulo, instead of trying to uh, say, come on guys, this is a country, this is football. Let's send our best team. The world will see us. No, instead of that, they start to uh, fight each other. So saying bad things about the, about the people who had nothing to do with that. Yeah, As people, sure. everybody wanted Brazil to go with a good team. That was two hearted headed guys one from Rio, one from Sao Paulo, from Brazilian Federation, and Paulista Federation, who uh, said, okay, uh, if you don't want to go, we go by ourselves, and we went by ourselves. The newspapers from Rio said, we're going to win the championship. The Sao Paulo paper said, we have no chance at all. We're going to lose the first game and come back. Uh, so for historians, who read yeah. old newspapers to understand what happened. Uh, our suggestion is to read papers from Rio for, and from Sao Paulo and take an average of opinions because each one of them were <laughs> skewed. <laughs> Extreme, yeah. Yeah, 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 but to one side or another. Huh? This was around the time when uh, Rio de Janeiro was the capital and remained the capital until the 50s when it was moved to Brasilia. So they were the powerhouse for 500 years in the country. Uh, everything okay. European-wise, it was Rio de Janeiro, their relationship with France. Yeah. Uh, the 1910s and 1920s was around the time when Sao Paulo was really starting to develop economically. And today Sao Paulo is uh, not only the city, but also the state. It, it is 40% uh, of Brazil. 40% of our uh, gross product. Okay. And okay. Most of the states in Brazil uh, receive more money than they pay in taxes. So Sao Paulo was already becoming this. So there was a, a, a very intense rivalry because of this also, Rio de Janeiro wanted to maintain its uh, position on the top. Number one, Sao Paulo was coming in. Uh, 1932 also saw a war, a mini civil war between the state and Sao Paulo and the rest of Brazil because they wanted to change the constitution a little bit. So uh, it was a brief war, but Sao Paulo did fight a war against the rest of Brazil in 1932 in the 1930s. So uh, it, it really is impossible to talk about this national team selection without understanding what had happened in the previous 10 years. Yep. And of course, Sao Paulo grew because of immigration. Yeah, of course. Okay, uh, in, 19, in 1888, uh, our country abolished the slavery, one of the last in the world to do it. The last, <laughs> or probably the last, I don't know. Uh, and uh, our government allowed people from Europe mainly, uh, Italians in Sao Paulo, Germans uh, more in the south of Brazil, Spanish, and uh, they came because the situation in Italy, the end of uh, 19th century, was bad with famine and, and other problems. And uh, the, the state grew. Right? The immigrants, oh, Japanese as well, in 1905. Uh, well, everybody was here. All of us are mostly we descend from someone from, from another country. Somewhere else, yeah. We're, yeah. Yeah, we're just all a yeah, melting my, pot. My father is Swiss. 
Okay. My mother is from Italian descent. Mm -hmm. My maternal grandfather is from Slovenia. Wow. Okay. Because I don't have the, the but besides that, we have no uh, Brazilian relations for 400 years. And our story, but we are very Brazilians, of course. We were born when, when I are a kid. We were born here when we love the country. No? We do not want to leave. We want it to be better. But in 19, <laughs> they're back to 1930, that was a problem. That was a All problem. Right. You guys decide to fight for power. And uh, Sao Paulo didn't get the member of the technical staff. And uh, we went with a weak team. And uh, our first adversary was Yugoslavia. And uh, we were happy, very, very happy, because uh, what was happening in Brazil at the time was happening in Yugoslavia as well. Uh, uh, a famous person in the history of the World Cup, uh, Mihailo, Andreevich, he was the head of the Yugoslavian delegation to Brazil. I, if I'm not wrong, you probably know better than I. Uh, Andreevich has been in all World Cups from 1930, from 1980 something. He is the only guy in the world who saw the first eight or nine or ten World Cups. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, he was I, yeah. because he worked for FIFA later as an observer in many I, I think he went to 86 or 90. Uh, but Mr. Andreevic, uh, when he arrived in Brazil, he gave an interview and he said that unfortunately there was a conflict, a technical football conflict between Croatia and Serbia inside Yugoslavia, and Croatia refused to give the players to the national team. So they, right. had, they had to take a, a Serbian team to come to Brazil. All Serbian team, yep. Yeah. And we two uh, players who were playing in France, two or three, one of them scored the goal in Brazil. That was Beck, Beck no? Ivan Beck. And uh, when we heard that, we said, well, if uh, Rio is fighting Sao Paulo, Belgrade is fighting the uh, Zagreb. <laughs> so it's okay, we're gonna beat them. And uh, then, uh, <laughs> as I said, the real newspaper said is an easy victory. The Sao Paulo paper said we don't have a team to beat anyone <laughs> in this world. Uh, <laughs> the description of the game is interesting because. Apparently, uh, there, the, 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 the weather on that day in Montevideo was very, very bad. It had rained the day before, right. it rained mm -hmm. in the morning, uh, it was very, very cold, and it was windy. And uh, as you probably know, the, the, the national, the Centenario State was built up in a hill. So it, yes. uh, when you see the pictures, the, 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 the stadium is alone. To, together is a neighbor, uh, today is a neighborhood. And it was 11 meters below the level of the floor because of yeah. the wind, to protect it against the wind, or at least the And that day probably didn't happen. That was a very, very strong wind from the South Pole called Pampero. And uh, Yugoslavia, in the first half, they played uh, what was that? in favor. Yeah, Brazil played against the wind. Yeah, Brazil played against the wind the first half and lost 2-0. And uh, Yugoslavia played against the wind the second half and lost 1-0. So final 2-1. That's uh, right, that's tough. Yeah, because uh, th th there, was, there were two uh, very, very different halves. But if you take the uh, statistics, uh, I have it somewhere here, uh, the number of uh, falls committed and the number of corners were equal. Oh, yeah. well, that doesn't surprise me. I mean, that's, 
the number, I mean, that was a very, very, very brutal World Cup in terms of fouls. And the, the, in fact, the interpretation of rules, you know, one, one particular difference is uh, in the United States and over in Europe, you are allowed to, to charge the goalie. Right. If you were, and if you were able to charge him, even when he had the ball, and he and you knocked him and the ball into the goal, it was a goal. Right. You see, but down in in South America, that posed a problem. You know, uh, just for the United States, because they were being booed uh, yeah. all the time because of their misinterpretation of this just this specific rule. Right. So that would cause a lot of uh, uh, a lot of fouls, a lot of uh, uh, fights that could be uh, erupting, and miscomprehension of uh, of the style of a team. So, so I, I understand the the equal foul and and corner uh, statistics. And, and uh, uh, there there's a. Uh... An Uruguayan referee in 1930, and he said that uh, uh, the FIFA had a, a meeting with the referees and, and, and talked about rules. And one of, of them was exactly the contact, which was very different. And the Uruguayan referee said that when uh, he directed the game, he didn't know it wa if it was a fall or not. Uh, the, the, referees. Referees were very dependent upon the linesmen to make the calls. Yeah, but there, there was a, 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 in Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay, uh, the contact with the shoulder, we, it was called hammer in Brazil. You hammer. Right, right, uh, right. Uh, it was not permitted. It was a fault. And when, uh, when we were right. playing among, amongst ourselves, if someone touched you, you just fall on the ground, and, and it's a fault. And, uh, okay, so so now I know where that all came from. Yeah, you know, was, Neymar yeah. is our great specialist on that. You touch him, he falls. Uh, but it, it has been the same in South America forever. Yes. Yeah. Learn how right. to jump on the floor. Europeans, although they, the, the Americans, they did not because they knew it was not a fault. Yeah. Yeah. If you fall on the ground, you lose the ball. So yeah, st exactly. Stand and go after it. <laughs> One of our players, the uh, uh, Fausto, which was the, the probably the best player of Brazil, the center half, he said after the game that we lost because we played like senoritas. And so everybody in the Yugoslavian came near when well, we were just jumping on the floor and, and, and scream for a fault. That, that was one of them. the. The other thing is that, of course, the team was weak. And uh, the, our two center forwards did not play. They were from Rio de Janeiro. One uh, was Rusinho, little Russian. Rusinho, who was from Vasco da Gama. And the other was Carvalho Leite, who was from Botafogo. But, they were not fit to play because one of them, Rusinho, had a flu and Carvalho Leite had a, a broken hand or a broken bone of a hand and uh, he had a cast and they took it out just days in, in, before the first match already. Okay. Yeah. They, they didn't play. And then we had uh, a line with three players who play as a... Uh, on the, said not the wing, not a center four, not a wing, the guy in between. Uh, uh, what, a halfback or, or a midfielder? Uh, no, up front. Left oh, the, the, the center forward. Yeah, uh, uh, number eight and number 10. Okay. So number nine. This is so eight. the three guys who were supposed to attack from the center. Yeah. So the three of them in their clubs in Brazil, they played in the left side, number 10. Mm, yes. 
in Uruguay, they all went to the left side. That's what they, uh, and Ur <laughs> Yugoslavia went to the incredible space between them, to the right. And from the right, they scored their two goals in the first half and had a third one that uh, was not conceded by, at the time, the famous uh, out of game when you were not participating. So you were far away looking at it, but you were offside anyway. We could have lost three new in the first half. The second half, right. uh, with the wind favoring us, uh, Brazil apparently, uh, according to the newspapers, dominated the game, scored the goals. The Yugoslavian uh, goalkeeper, the goalie, they made fantastic uh, defenses and we lost. And uh, of course, after the game, it was all about, it was too cold, it was uh, freezing, uh, the, the violence of the uh, Yugoslav uh, team and everything, excuses. We, in the second game, we won for new against Bolivia, but it didn't matter because Yugoslavia also won for new and we were out. There, there are two uh, nice facts about this Brazil-Yugoslavia game. Uh, Brazil committed 11 fouls and Yugoslavia committed 10, which is a very low number, which makes you wonder how violent it would have to be to actually be called a foul. Right. At least That's right. two or three teeth knocked out, maybe you get a, a foul call. But uh, the Yugoslavian team, very interestingly, uh, is the national team with the lowest uh, average age in the history of the World Cup. So this Yugoslavian team from 1930 having, had an average age of 21 years and eight months. So wow. they were a very, very young, uh, inexperienced team, actually. Inexperienced. Of this fight between Serbia and Croatia, you know, only Serbian players went. So... Uh, that actually makes Brazil's defeat seem a little bit worse because the Yugoslavians, you know, we were complaining that they were violent, but Brazil had more fouls and uh, they were very, very much younger than Brazil. So it really was a matter of uh, not having the chemistry together, only sending you know, much more fighting than trying to understand what we're doing here.